Hi, Philip A. McClyman here. Just wanted to thank you for listening to my podcast. It's a blast making it, and an even bigger blast knowing you are enjoying it. If you are enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting it with a one-time donation of $3, which is about the price of a cheap cup of coffee. The link to do that is in the show notes, right there at the top. I am usually drinking coffee when I record the podcast, so it kind of makes sense. Okay, thanks again for listening. On to the next episode, and the next cup of coffee. Prologue. Beverly Sanders knew he didn't resent her. She knew that the anger that so quickly flared to the surface of so many recent conversations, and the meanness that resulted, lashing out like a tendril and tearing into her soul, was not actually her fault. She knew that. Mark knew it too. She was sure of it. It wasn't even that she took the job. Neither she nor her husband was possessed of dated sensibilities that said a woman's place was in the home. They were partners, and as such, worked together to raise a family and make their way in the world. It took two, but now there was just the one, doing the work of two. She knew he didn't resent her, but her working two jobs and he working none aided him like a cancer. For while their sensibilities were well rooted in the twenty first century, he was still a man, and a man worked to provide for his family. And now he couldn't. It wasn't a physical injury that disabled him. That could have been viewed as a badge of honor, a visible sign of his indescribable bravery that compelled him to step in harm's way and eliminate the threat. Though many had died, Many more were alive because of what he did. A desperate individual with planning and forethought had laid waste to so many, but not to all. Sunny Island was a state park. It was an oasis of land in the center of Lake Jeremy, a favorite gathering spot for campers and families looking to create memories. The island could only be reached by ferry. It was Founder's Day, and Scott Hammond had been looking forward to it for weeks. He boarded the ferry with nothing in his possession but the clothes he wore. He was invisible among the throngs of people making their way to the island. Had he survived, it would have argued against his case that he didn't know what he was doing at the time. The authorities theorized, upon seeing the huge cachet of weapons and ammunition, that he had stockpiled for a long time. Security footage confirmed that he had made several trips to the island in the days and weeks leading up to the Clydesville Founders' Day celebration. Mark Sanders was there with Beverly and their young son, Tommy. Times being what they were, Mark took the opportunity to work security for the event. They could use the extra money, and he still got to enjoy the day with his family a little until the shooting started. Hammond had dug in high on a hill overlooking a wide expanse of beach on the south side of the island. The beach was where everybody had gathered for good food and good music under a clear blue sky. When he started shooting, it looked like the beach at Normandy. Bodies just blew apart. People screamed and ran, fell and died. He was dug in and had an elevated position with a clear line of sight. It would have been an hour, maybe more, before the authorities could have responded with anything that might have been able to stop him. So while the few other cops working the event hunkered down, Mark Sanders stormed the hill in the face of the deadly onslaught. It took minutes that seemed to stretch into hours in his mind, not being able to simply stroll up the hiking trail to the summit. Bobbing and weaving, Diving and hiding, he fought for every inch until he got to the top. Armed only with his service pistol, he charged the hill and eliminated the threat. 
Though no bullet had touched him, it was only later discovered that he was in fact deeply wounded. He could no longer be around crowds. Acute agoraphobia, resulting from post-traumatic stress, prevented him from being out in the open and around people. He was getting help, but the process was slow, and it prevented him from being able to do his job as a Clydesville police officer, or do any job at all. So Beverly took a second job, on the night shift, just to make ends meet. Chapter 1 I'm sorry too. I love you, Mark. We're going to get through this. Beverly Sanders stared out the windshield and drove through the night towards the Clydesville power station. They had gotten into a fight, like they always did just before she had to leave for the night shift. He had called to apologize, just like he always did before she was even halfway there. Dr. Foster says you're making progress, but that it's important to focus on achievable goals and not to get frustrated, she said. She could hear him sigh and knew that those words wouldn't even make a dent. She listened as he recounted again how sorry he was, how pissed off he was, what a failure he was. No, I won't accept that. You're not a failure, Mark. People are alive because of you. That's what you need to focus on. That and the next goal, okay? She said. There was silence on the other end, and she knew he was processing. We'll get through this. Until then, we do what we have to do, right? What do you always say when faced with a problem? Ain't nothing to it but to do it? She heard him laugh just a little, but it was enough, and she knew they were good for the night. Having to work an entire shift without having smoothed it all out was a bitch. We're doing it, and we're going to keep doing it until it's done, she said. He told her he loved her, and a tear rolled down her cheek. I love you too. Kiss Tommy goodnight for me, okay? See you in a bit, she said, then hung up. She tossed the phone on the passenger seat and stared at it for several long seconds. When she looked up, it was too late. She screamed and whipped the wheel to the left, but she still hit her. There was a sickening thump, a distant look and a blank stare of a wide-eyed female face caught in her headlights. Then the face was gone as the woman tumbled into a ditch by the side of the road. Beverly slammed on the brakes and brought the car to a stop across both lanes of traffic. Panicked and shaking, she fumbled for the door handle and got out. She ran to the ditch to look for the woman. When she got there, the woman was struggling to her feet. Her left leg was twisted at an unnatural angle, but it didn't stop her from trying to rise and walk. Beverly rushed into the ditch. The woman didn't turn or cry out or even shout obscenities at her. Beverly ran up to the woman and put her hand on her shoulder, stopping her. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Are you all right? I... The woman turned and looked at Beverly, and the stare, blank and empty, brought her up short. Beverly's voice caught in her throat as she stumbled back. Her skin crawled, and her only thought was to get away. I'm going to call somebody, okay? Stay right here, and I'll get help, Beverly said. Beverly ran to her car, flung open the passenger side door, and grabbed for her phone. It wasn't on the seat. Beverly's eyes scanned the interior, finding the phone on the floor. She grabbed it and held it up in front of her face. With shaking hands, she tried to remember the number for 911. When she finally got it dialed, an automated voice recording played in her ear. We're sorry. All circuits are busy. Please try again later. Beverly pulled the phone away from her ear and stared in horror at the display. No! she screamed. She hit redial as she ran back over to the ditch to check on the woman. The same automated message played in her ear as Beverly frantically scanned the ditch for the woman who wasn't there.